<laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it switches the microphone. Okay, perfect. Here we go. We start again the presentation. Okay. It's loading. So we said, uh, we talked about uh, ethical problems, right? We saw them all here. We have them all, uh, or the concerns. Now we move on for a second part where we identified and mapped all these potential problems, um, realistic problems even, and we check how, how we can reply to those. We say that uh, we'll see that for this, there are two main approaches to take from an ethical standpoint. Um, and one is related to virtue ethics. So we'll go back also to Gabriele's question, to some of the questions raised before. And the other one is that is more practical. Um, so let's go into that. What is the most ethical approach in order to tackle the problems uh, that we have raised? So one approach is, okay, let's focus on the what. The what means uh, when we have concerns such as uh, maybe unfair outcomes or uh, unscrutable evidence, how do we reply to those with some what? Almost uh, values um, as virtue ethics would do that we ought to uphold as we deal with algorithms. This would be, okay, um, you have unfair outcomes. The reply to that to, uh, from my side is we put a value there your algorithm should be a fair one, if it ought to be, uh, let's say, a virtuous algorithm. Um, okay, you do not have, uh, you have inscrutable, unscrutable evidence, then your value, the value for that should be explainability uh, or transparency. And your algorithm, in order to be virtuous, should respect that. Now, that's a strand that, at least to me, resembles a lot uh, the efforts of virtue ethics. Um, so we're going to present that because it's, I think, where most efforts are going in right now. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, where most guidelines also are being written at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of requests for fairness, uh, avoidance of bias. And I think that's a really important uh, step to take, but maybe not the only one. In fact, there is also another approach which resemble, I would say, another ethical uh, approach um, yeah, paradigm that we encountered at the start. Maybe this is more wishful thinking. Let me know. I do not know. I'm not sure myself about this thought, but I think if instead of telling uh, what the values ought to be to apply to these concerns, we provide potential solutions in terms of a bit like deontology. That's the bridge that I wanted to make there. Uh, not to tell um, people, companies to be fair as a value, uh, but providing them with rules how to be so, to behave fairly, let's say. And in that sense, um, that's much, that's a field that is just developing now. So in order to deal with ethical concerns, we're not going to reply with a set of virtues that uh, a certain algorithm should respect, but we're going to provide you with a set of tools or of rules, both for practitioners or for people within government, to make sure that you can act fairly or you can enact also that principles of fairness. I see that closer to deontology because of this aspect of action and not consequentialist because it's not overtly so. It does not focus mainly on, it's not concerned mainly with maximizing the consequences. It's really about let's be fair in the process. But let me know what you think because this might also be a little bit of a step. Uh, so. If we focus on the how, so the pragmatic, I call it pragmatic because concerned with action, ethical approach, then we talk about tools, tools for fairness, tool for bias, for explainability. But let's see, let's see about both, right? So first, the what's a virtue ethics approach. What does that entail? So um, I found some definitions uh, which I found, yeah, it's quite, it's quite nice um, to present uh, what a virtue ethics approach would translate into when we talk about um, AI ethics um, in case we just focus on the values. Um, and it's the principles put forward 
and the principles uh, I ask you to think about maybe you know the these ethical AI principles that are being published now we're going to see them later on where we're just saying and AI should be fair explainable etc cetera, etc cetera. so those principles can as abstractions act as normative constraints and for those I mean like should and should not so on the do's and don'ts of algorithmic human society found this to be a good uh, good way of translating virtue ethics into into AI ethics uh, in the what approach so what what does that translate into in practice so we have more than 70 documents as ethical guidelines that have been published in the last two years that's a lot and uh, I think now they are already 80 um, so it's uh, it's getting more and more I took this from a paper but uh, it was uh, 2019 so it's still I believe in this last year at least 15 more <laughs> uh, have been published by governments intergovernmental institutions um, so let's see what those are uh, as I said the industry uh, came up with some uh, Google and IBM government uh, from uh, Canada with the Montreal Declaration um, also a host of governments in the high level expert group in the commission a group that was devised basically a group of experts devised to come up with these ethical guidelines for algorithms um, which came came out to be okay an algorithm should be ethical lawful and robust and in order to do that it should respect fairness accountability and that's a series of values that follows from that then also intergovernmental institutions such as the ECD uh, they were one of the first and academia I mean not strictly academia but more from an academics perspective the future of life institutes and IEEE also produced guidelines on AI so what about that when we go back to our ethical problems um, I told you that I would ask you to come up with uh, potential, potential solutions in terms of values, right? How to reply uh, to inconclusive evidence, how to reply to misguided evidence. Um, so within that, we'll go step by step and I will look at the chat and I will ask you to write a value because we are, remember, exercising our virtue ethics approach, uh, a value that for you could be up to the task uh, in order to reply to inconclusive evidence, let's say. Ready? Okay, I'm gonna look at the chat. How, what value should we ask for inconclusive evidence? So evidence that is not totally accurate, let's say, uh, but maybe it's 99%, 85%. How could we tackle that? What, what would you ask an algorithm to be virtuous with? It's a bit, it might be tough, but I'm just gonna look at the chat. Fairness, I see. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mamadou was courageous. I don't see other people writing. Ooh. I see different, different metrics fair. I mean, this is uh, at the end what it boils down to. The best expression of it is look at human self-fiction. Nice, nice. Nice to see the replies, guys. Well, partly maybe I would follow Maurice in saying accuracy in terms of if we define, define inconclusive evidence as the 99% that does not arrive at 100%, if that's tricky, that problem, and if, if it's located only that, then it's accuracy. However, I also saw I think it was Sabrina Patania who said different metrics. That's also a really good point. We are now being strictly like following and narrowly uh, looking at two inconclusive evidence as a technical problem almost, but we will see that there's more to that. Accuracy is something, but it's not the end of the reply. Another one, what do you do with inscrutable evidence? Remember that we saw that related to black box. What would you ask? Uh, as a value in order to solve that issue. Integrity. I see. That's also an interesting one, maybe related to accountability. Explainability, that's a nice one. 
a measure of uncertainty. We'll wait a last couple of seconds. When I see a reply from Lavina before, combine efforts of fairness and accuracy, that's, yeah, that's it. Okay, for the moment, inscrutable evidence, I also would agree with explainability and transparency, and hopefully combined. Of course, now we're being idealistic, right? Uh, but maybe rightfully so, but we're still playing with as, as virtue ethicist. So uh, if you have a black box, we would like explainability to be enforced in order to be able to um to basically understand and uh for the actions and the outputs to be justified but at the same time transparency that maybe comes even before explainability in order to generate that explanations based on the different steps that have been going on within the algorithm life cycles great challenge of course not not easy at all okay misguided evidence what about this one so misguided evidence, we said that, okay, our detective had a series of, of clues from different people in the village, and he had to base his judgment on that, but um, he wasn't sure about his evidence, how, I don't want to say the word, um, how neutral it was, for example. What would you say it's a value to tackle misguided evidence? Equity, I see. Anyone else? It's a tough one, maybe. Transparency, I see. Oh, bias. I mean, just in the way we defined it before and how we looked at it in the within the problem, we talked about bias. Uh, or we talked about uh, non-neutral uh, data on which the judgment of the detective was based on, ultimately, and uh, that's why we now come up with bias. So misguided evidence is not just, I mean, to be honest, what you said, guys, about transparency also helps the case. Uh, bias is just like the elephant in the room there, but transparency would be an integral value uh, also to detect bias within that. Okay, so we are halfway through. What about, what about uh, unfair outcome? This is like given away by the name. What would you ask as a value to tackle unfair outcomes? Um, fairness, fair, uh, you're great guys. <laughs> yes, fairness, uh, exactly. I mean, I wanted to kind of twitch the name a bit from unfair outcomes to something more black box and obscure like, but I didn't make it, so I gave this one away. But yes, as a value to unfair outcomes, pretty straightforwardly, I think the reply would be fairness. What about transformative effects? And that's, the name itself doesn't say much, right? So I can recall that in the case with the detective, it was when you had the robot Watson profiling everyone uh, and aiding and helping the detective um, through its profiling activities, which even though might seem questionable, didn't seem to have any sort of uh, negative ethical connotation related to that. What would be the problem with, uh, and here maybe we're aiming at a value um, which has become more important nowadays and was more we were less focused on that uh, before. It's something of a value that is very much part of the fourth revolution, as we discussed before. Gabri, nice. Yeah, privacy. I would also, I mean, in the way we discussed, we discussed it before, I would, I would tie to privacy. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, was barely a value before or something that we wanted to enforce, especially before the fourth revolution, and uh, the more um, algorithms and their effects spread through society, the more we actually see the value 
of privacy, uh, given the potential effects. And this goes back to one of your questions at the start as well. Uh, I think one of, at the very beginning related to privacy. Traceability, okay guys, last one. Um, so traceability, remember, um, Watson and the detective think they have, they have solved the case, but they're not totally sure. I mean, no, they say it, uh, sorry, they are sure, they say to the villagers, and then people come up to them later on and they're like, mm, actually, that's not the culprit, we think, and how did you reach this conclusion? And we are found at the point where, okay, how can they justify the conclusion they have reached? Whose fault is that? Is the error of Watson or of the detective? Ooh, we have accountability, reproducibility. The good ones. In fact, accountability. One, uh, Mamadou and Irene, yes, really correct. Okay, so we have these host of values. Um, if we were to build, uh, if we were to be the Aristotle of modernity, uh, we would say a virtuous algorithm would have all these values put together. Uh, okay, so similarly, some Arist little Aristotles of uh, modernity have put together 70 documents which actually deal with these values called ethical guidelines, as we said in the last three years. Um, these are many. And uh, that's good, right? That there are so many of them, because this shows uh, that there is an emerging consensus slowly um, within what we think, what counts as good in terms of um, how an AI should be. Uh, but why is that? Because it actually caters only to the first part, which is the virtue ethics approach. Um, for example, if you're a technical person, and I'm sure many of you are in the room, but even if you're just someone within a government or a company having to deal with algorithms, receiving this brief on your, on your desk and being like, okay, I have to add my algorithms. Uh, I need them to be fair. I need them to be unbiased. You also need a sort of guide, uh, be that technical, be that uh, a guide uh, in terms of policy guide in order to enforce those. Otherwise the onus is just on you. And I think that's the second part of the effort we, we should engage in. So a review of 84 ethical AI documents um, found that no single principle, which is fairness, accountability, what we saw now, featured in all of them. So we just said, talked about consensus, but that's a bit of confusion. Uh, nevertheless, so we, may, we might save the day, themes of transparency, justice, fair, justice and fairness, normal efficiency, responsibility and privacy appeared in over half. And here you can see it. This is the table from, uh, from the study. And you can see that until uh, responsibility, right? And privacy, yes. Uh, these, there is a count in number of documents and these keywords appear in over half of the ethical guidelines that have been reviewed. Then also maybe you want to look at it a bit more. Feel free also, I mean, this talk will be on YouTube later on, um, and feel free to take screenshots as well. This is not my work, I have the source down there, uh, but I think it's really, really, uh, it's, it's a crazy research. It's a lot of work to go into any ethical guideline existing and look for the, um, the most found values there. So themes of privacy, security, autonomy, justice, human dignity, control of technology, and the balance of powers were recurrent. Um, and here you can also look at the keywords, included codes, because uh, that is also probably the reason why what we stated at the start, that uh, no single principle appeared in all of them. This could also be a linguistic problem, right? Uh, within different cultures, but also within different silos or environments from industry to government, we tend to talk about maybe the same values with different words or related values with different words. So that's why the research also went into calculating what some concepts, uh, key concepts and included codes that might have referred to the same ethical principle. Okay, so, but Kant comes back to us, right? Uh, and he tells us that we have learned how to be virtuous. No, we just, we didn't really learn how to be virtuous. We have been told to be virtuous. 
and not how so, how to behave according to this duty, how to do that. Well, uh, some researchers pointed that out about the ethical guidelines. They said, it's important to know not only what to do or not to do, but also how to do it and avoid doing it, right? We need some sort of guidance. Um, the guidelines often suggest that technical solutions exist, they are out there, but very few provide uh, what are technical explanations. And I found a really interesting statistic that says 79% of tech workers, which is a lot, report that they would like practical resources to help them with ethical considerations. That's a big number. Um, I guess this points at the fact that we need a mapping from virtue ethics to deontology. We need a mapping uh, from what to hows. Uh, we need to have a how for every what. So partly AI for people, in AI for people, we started and tried to do this. I would like to show you, this is not only our work, but if you're interested on the page, we, I know this is the old one, okay, I'll do an SAI. This is what we have tried to do. So all these principles I presented to you now, they're basically uh, linked every problem to every principle, every value. And for each, we tried to go on those and to list what could be useful for each technical person in terms of models, GitHub repositories, in order to enforce that values within your work. Of course, you might point the fingers at us as well. We're not telling you step by step how to do it. We're basically just being a platform um, and we just research um, in order to put some resources together that might help technical people. That for sure, like much more work needs to be done there and we are working on it, I swear. Uh, but that's enough. I don't want to go into any publicity. I prefer to present material. So this is what we got. I lost the full screen, right? Okay, presentation, go back. Okay, so that's it. And of course, not all the work um, was inspired by us, but there's this table. I will share the slides. These two links link to fundamental work done in Oxford that really helped us in shape, uh, in shaping this, uh, this in mapping the what to the how. Okay, so we have discussed basically the most ethical approaches. Now, uh, I promised you to also go into the lawful approaches. I heard some people asking about regulatory oversight, right? Uh, now, I know that we have an important part, which is the hands-on exercise. It's rather long, and I want us to really, I mean, I think maybe I'm biased, but I think it would be really nice as a course in AI ethics to also go into the practice of it um, instead of just talks. Um, so I will maybe um, go a little bit faster here. Uh, but I will take questions after the lawful approach. And then we go into the bias, the bias example case study. Okay, ready? So we have examples, uh, challenges within establishing a lawful framework for AI. We saw that there are several documents that have been put out there in the last three years. I wanted to just like give you a map of where these documents have been drafted. So a lot in... Um, in, in the North, I mean, basically, uh, most ethic guidelines are released in the United States, up to 21. Within the European Union, we have 19. Then the UK has 13. Japan has four. And then we have like Canada, Iceland, Norway, the UAE, India, Singapore, South Korea, Australia have also one each. Uh, so that's, that's good. And many, many countries also have endorsed uh, the uh, G7 statement about AI. So that's something, but actually uh, I was talking about this map with Phil and we considered that most of the production in terms of AI does not come from the West at all. It comes from Africa, uh, partly comes also from China, some things in India, like South America. There's really almost as if a lot of ethical talks are being done uh, in a delinked way from the production. So that's maybe that's a hint for thoughts. And if anyone likes to research on this, this is a great topic for research. I, I just launched this to you. 
so yes, the one example is from government. You have the ethical guidelines from the EU. We saw before they require an AI to be lawful, ethical, and robust. There's also, there's recently been a white paper that has been published on artificial intelligence still by the European Union, basically proposing a risk framework for AI, uh, which means if a certain AI application is deemed high risk uh, um, in terms of sector and in terms of application, one example of an high risk application would be uh, an algorithm that is used probably to detect heart failure, as we saw before. So that's, that would be considered high risk uh, because it deals with the life of people uh, and at the same time because it is within the healthcare sector. So context and application are both high risk. In that case, the regulations which are coming will be quite stringent in terms of privacy, in terms of accuracy of all the values that we have seen. Uh, and the stringency of that values will depend on the risk level. That's a proposal. There have been many white papers after that going against uh, basing our whole framework on risk, but I would like to hear your, your opinion on this because uh, this is a tough one. Then intergovernmental institutions, the OECD were some of the first ones to put out their, their principles. Still, all these are examples of virtue ethics approaches, right? Uh, where people just tell how an AI could be and should be, which I think it's fundamental. It's just, it, we do not, finish the work there, we still have a long way. Then academia, I'm going a bit quick because I want to get to the, to the case study, but I want you to get some time to at least have a look at the values here. Finally, industry, it's like Google, IBM, they were quite quick. For example, um, Google just lists fairness, interpretability, privacy and security, and I went into the definitions and they maybe have like one line to define fairness, but in their credit, they also have been developing uh, together. Also, IBM did a lot of efforts on fairness and, and stuff like this. So, I mean, the, the issues, is, is, it's more complicated than what I make it appear. Challenges. None of those that I've just presented to you is binding. So let's say we are a company dealing with AI and we just do not care about these uh, guidelines, we will be okay unless we go against the GDPR. The GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation by uh, first drafted, of course, and also passed within the European uh, Union. Uh, and that's uh, many people actually advocate. That's the only piece of legislation now we have that can be enforced uh, in terms of AI. Uh, not the only one, maybe that's not totally fair. We have also a lot of frameworks uh, dealing more of course, with uh, uh, you know, human rights, for example, there is parts of law that are applicable to what's happening with algorithms, but the approach is still ad hoc. We do not have a sole legislation for AI that covers comprehensively the problems with AI. Some people, some professors, uh, Florida, for example, in Oxford, advocated for a readaptation of GDPR catered to AI. That's a great idea, it's just that in the commission, believe me, it's tough to return something into law. It's a huge process. Uh, quantity over quality, we have a lot of uh, guidelines, but are these all good? We saw that there's not a lot of overlap, even though there is some. Um, we saw that many of them also are Western-centric and not enough is being covered, uh, for example, by, by what is being done um, in terms of guidelines, India, in Singapore, uh, China, also many countries from Africa are coming up with their own guidelines. Uh, so there's a lot, it's really a movement happening now. Uh, and ooh, they're not all the time participative or democratic. Many of them, like the one of the European Commission, just entailed a group of experts. Uh, but uh, the Montreal Declaration, I must say, it's a great example. So it was done in Canada where these guidelines have been based, so these values of virtue ethics have been based on people's consultations. They invited citizens, they sat down with them for a long period of time, they, um, they informed them about AI and they came up, citizens themselves, they deliberated on what they thought would be the best uh, values for an AI to have. So some of them, but really few, one, have been participative. Participate 
Okay. Well, now uh, I would like to take take some questions uh, because we're going in the hands-on case study, and that's um, that will be not too long. But I really need you. You might have to use your computer there. Um, so yes, I think we need a five-minute question session um, to then go on to that. Okay, I'm looking. Phil, do you have a little summary of questions? Maybe two or three, or should I just go through them? No problem, just whatever. If you have, it's good. Otherwise, I'll, I'll go up and down. Okay, perfect. I can take this one. So, for example, uh, Irene, um, about the risk approach, what, who do you think should assess the level of risk? Who? Would self-regulation be effective? That's a really uh, good question. Uh, Self-regulation has been a talk recently, a really important talk. Uh, that's what was enforced, or the idea was of self-regulation at the start. So the commission or various states would put out these non-binding regulatory frameworks. And then eventually what we would rely on, because they're non-binding, is self-regulation from, let's say, industry. Um, this can be problematic. Uh, because uh, we are reliant, right? We are trusting uh, other actors, which even though uh, goodwill, let's, let's suppose, might incur into problems. Uh, there's not a framework right now uh, that goes beyond self-regulation. So I do think self-regulation alone, uh, it's, it's, it's not enough, not because I do not trust uh, single actors, and not only because of that, um, but also because sometimes you need a support apparatus in order to enforce, even as a company, um, fairness, avoidance of bias. Uh, there are many companies who have never dealt with this question, sadly, and now is the time. Uh, but we need a proper apparatus to not just help them, but to make sure this is being dealt with in the, in the right way. So I think self-regulation is not the only way. Uh, who do you think should assess the level of risk? Similarly, then it's not, oh, this is a tough one. <laughs> I'm not sure. Like, I would like to say um, there should be a sort of independent panel, and that's what has been uh, advised and also being set up in certain companies. Uh, many other people have also, uh, there's big talks about auditing algorithms, so building a sort of system, uh, independent system um, that makes sure that every algorithm becomes certified and audited for bias and for all the rest, this would also, this would also take the burden away from, um, for example, practitioners who do not know how to enforce bias partly. So that's a possibility. But we don't have anything like an auditing system for algorithms yet. Um, so that's big work. Um, what about, uh, so uh, Aishatu? Uh, what about the, reg the regulatory environment? How do you see this evolving in the US in contrast to Europe or Asia? It's a really good question. China is emerging as a major superpower in AI. Do they think similarly about this issue as the Western countries do? And if so, what should we expect? Um, so I am really interested in, in China. I, um, I went there a couple of times. Uh, I followed also a degree um, on Chinese uh, language and culture. Still, I do not feel like I can have a solid grasp of what China is doing with AI. Uh, it's because of the firewall of their secrecy, it's tough to tell. When you actually look at their regulatory framework, it's largely based on the US one. They're deeply similar. Um, however, uh, they have totally different regulations, for example, in terms of internet. So they're net uh, differently from the US as really stringent regulations. You might know it, there is the firewall. Uh, people in China cannot connect to Google, for example. Um, in that sense, uh, I see two major, a major trend, which is in China, what is the framework uh, that is going to guide the future of AI comes from the government, top bottom, um, while in the US, it's more um, from companies to the government. Uh, through lobby power. I see both as two emerging trends that are quite dangerous. I like what Europe is doing, uh, even though it makes us weaker to focus mostly on ethics and on participation. I think it's a more sustainable framework in the long term. 
uh, I think it's really dangerous to just let lobby power decide or just the government enforce a framework. I like our middle way, but I might be biased too. Okay, I'll take a last one just so that we have the case study. Um, oh, we have two. Lavina, I take the first one and I hope you're fine with that. Really, if I don't reply to all questions, please message me on LinkedIn uh, or email. I'll be really happy to continue the conversation. Uh, if risk frameworks put into place and agreed upon, how can we show that it works as an ethical soundboard, holding people accountable? Is this going to be enough? Ooh. Um, I would say that so once, even if we, you, well, your question basically addresses the point at which we have a risk framework, uh, we have that in place. It might seem sound in practice. How do we ensure that that works the way we need it to work, right? And we want it to work. Um, I do think it's going to be a trial and error um, period. Uh, it's not going to be necessarily pretty. Uh, it will be a tough one. Um, I hope within that, that there's going to be uh, a shift in more, um, democratic participation and citizen participation, because I think ultimately what we want these systems to be in their effects is to have effects that respond to the need of the population. These needs should not be assumed at high up levels, but they should be listened to, uh, especially in an age when democracy uh, is turning um, a bit rusty. So I think this is really the moment whenever we have these, these risk frameworks in mind and we apply them uh, to make sure that citizens have participation within those. Still, technically speaking, we need people from totally different disciplines, from technical people, people from government, policymakers, to all act uh, at different levels of risk assessment frameworks to make sure they're sound. A bit to have like a AI life cycle for the risk assessment frameworks where we can go back several times and reiterate whenever we go wrong. Sorry for the high level reply, but I do not know if I can go more in detail. I hope that's, that's good enough. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, now, I don't want to overwhelm you, but we are going to have now a hands-on case study. I'm going to give you the link for what you need as we go along. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat. Um, as a disclaimer, the work that you're going to see uh, it's not mine. I basically dissected uh, this work because I thought it was really good in understanding how bias and fairness work within a certain environment. Um, but I'll give all the credit. Uh, it can be found in the MIT Technology Review and they've built a great tool for that. Okay, so surprise, surprise, in the hands-on case study, we're going to see the Compass algorithm. I do not know if you are really familiar with this, so I'm going to go through it, but I know that there's a lot of talk about the compass algorithm within algorithmic fairness. Well, first, to take it out of the way, we need a definition of bias. What's really important here is there's a different definition often in uh, social psychology and law, statistics, uh, algorithms, uh, or like in the machine learning field. Often when we talk about bias, we're truly talking about different things from different fields. And that's why I think to get it out of the way, we should really establish what do we mean within each field. So first of all, uh, three words that come together, bias, discrimination, and fairness. Um, they're often used to refer to problems involving data sets or algorithms uh, that disadvantage certain individuals over others or, or certain groups over others. It is not clear that all cases referred to by these terms involve the same type of problems, right? Often we think about bias as something that belongs to the data or the data set. And if that is there, we have discrimination. Uh, and we might respond to that, to that with fairness. But at the same time, we saw that often discrimination is a form of disparate impact. We saw in the detective story about unfair outcomes, right? Uh, within that, often, even so we make sure our data set is bulletproof, which is a bit unrealistic, sometimes we might discriminate just because our world data set, our world gym on which we are playing our algorith algorithms on uh, is not even. So it's more complicated than that. And uh, these terms come together, but often they're not really the same. 
uh, but I promise to you to explain more about bias, right? So in, within psychology and law, um, bias uh, talks about or refers to negative attitudes or prejudices towards a particular group. Often what comes up also in social psychology and law is implicit bias. Uh, implicit bias understood as unconscious attribution of particular qualities uh, to a member of a certain social group uh, shaped by experience and based on learned associations between particular qualities of a person or a group and social categories. Uh, now, what is a really good to test for implicit bias, if you have not tried it, you should, as the impl implicit association test. It was developed in Harvard. It takes 10 to 15 minutes to complete. Um, and uh, you can test for your own implicit bias on, uh, for example, disability, race, skin tone, gender, and so on and so forth. Uh, I was really surprised uh, to be a woman and to have an implicit bias against my own gender. Uh, these are surprising results, but uh, there is a way in which we are really affected by the lives we lead. So this is something for you to do if you're interested after the talk or in the next day. Yeah, uh, I will send the link, that's true. So can you please remind me to send the link? And if you, if you type in implicit bias test, Harvard, this will be, this will be it. So thank you for that. IAT, it's the keyword. So that's a really interesting one. And uh, what about statistics? In statistics, a bias sample means a sample that does not adequately represent the distribution of features in the reference population. What does that mean? So it contains a higher proportion of young men than in the overall population, let's say. So in the world, we have this percentage of young men, uh, which is lower maybe than the one we have in our sample. This is already a biased sample because it's not representative of the world. Uh, as you will see here, I mean, clearly, as we do not have a mapping one-to-one -one from real world and data, um, it is difficult to have an unbiased sample. Nevertheless, this, this doesn't justify the fact that a sample is biased. Uh, in machine learning, instead, we talk about bias in terms of um, errors of estim in estimation or over and under representing populations when sampling. Um, now, this is similar, of course, uh, to the one in statistics. Um, in fact, machine learning is largely based on statistics. Um, and I would like to present you an example, an easy one, uh, this exercise was conducted by Professor Zikari at Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, and I think it really helps us to understand how bias can work uh, when we talk about um, technical bias. So we don't take people, but we take fruits. Uh, we have strawberries and melons. And we say two people are tasked with developing a system to sort a basket of fruit. They have to determine which pieces are high quality and will be sold at the market, so market is a good thing, and which will instead be used for making jam. So jam is like, it's not, good, it's not a good fruit, we're just send it to the jam factory. Now you imagine you have strawberries, melon, I added bananas, why not? Uh, what would be your criteria for quality to sort them? Which ones will you send to the market? Now think about it, maybe two minutes. This is not yet the case study, so uh, no worries. I will not reveal what, what bias is in terms of fruit, but it's just to warm up. Ripeness, uh-huh, that's a good one. So you will send the unripe ones to the market maybe, because I don't know, for jam, you might re need ripe fruit, right? but you can make your criteria. Yeah, aspect, uh -huh, so look, right? That's, that's a big thing in, in fruit. I taste and smell, cool. Look, yeah, similar to aspect. Touch, okay. Let's see one example. So the main, um, uh, the main intuition here is that when both people, two people, let's say, are given the exact same data, which is strawberry, 
strawberry, melons, and bananas, uh, and the same task, which is to sort them according to quality, we would expect them to be likely to have similar results, right? That's where we come from. Then I took two people randomly, and let's say one chooses uh, quality brightness of color, uh, then it would send strawberries to the market and melons to the jam factory. It might be weird to send melons to the jam factory, but it's just the example. And quality when unblemished, so unstained, uh, if that's your criteria for quality, you would send ripe, similar to what Phil said, melons and bananas to the market, but unripe, stained strawberries to the jam factory. So given the same data and, asked, uh, and tasked with the same task, you would end up with two completely different uh, conclusions. And the lesson learned here is that similarly logical and evenly applied criteria will result in two different outcomes for the same basket of fruit. Okay, that's okay for fruit, we might say, but what about humans? Uh, ML algorithms are used to automatize and assist decisions in all these fields that you see down here. Healthcare, judiciary, recruiting, journalism, banking, welfare. In which cases can AI applications have bias? All of them, uh, because they're all based on this criteria that we have just listed. Uh, data, task. Um, this is not to say that we should just throw them out of the window. It's just say, where should we be careful in all of them across the spectrum? Okay, but what are we going to focus on today is one case study in the judiciary system, which is recidivism risk assessments. Okay, now we enter our case study here. So the case of racial bias. We're going to go into the case of Compass, which is a software used in the US to predict the likelihood of a person committing a future crime. And this, uh, has, this software has been found uh, to be biased towards people of color. There was a lot of research done on it, but rarely uh, articles have dissected exactly what was going on within the algorithm. And that's what we're going to do today. So I, I need your brains on this. So what was the input, okay? Um, this algorithm, Compass, is uh, one of several risk assessment tools used in the US criminal legal system. And Compass is supposed to help judges determine whether a defendant should be kept in jail or be allowed out while awaiting trial. It trains on historical defendants data to find correlation between factor, factors such as what you see here, age, criminal record, and rearrest. Okay, um, and it uses this correlation to determine someone's level of risk, okay? Um, so if you are high risk, you go to jail. If you're determined low risk, instead, uh, which would be a seven, you are released. Yet yeah, these are the numbers. So the numbers of risk are from one to 10. Um, and uh, the compass algorithm puts the threshold between seven and eight. So below seven, you do not, you're not sent to prison. And above seven, so eight until 10, you are uh, sent uh, to prison, okay? Okay, so far so good, I hope. Um, I wanted to be fair and present what might be the arguments for pretrial risk assessment tools? It's not that someone woke up one morning and decided we should automatize in an evil manner all this process. There were proper arguments behind it, and I think some of them are well motivated. So these are two of them. One is that it eliminates judges' bias. So uh, there's a big problem in the US justice system uh, with bias coming directly from humans, from judges, that affects negatively populations of color. So Giving this work, yielding it to the machine, might improve uh, the main problem here. Uh, and another one is posting bail, which is another common practice in the US, um, which is basically whenever you're awaiting trial, you can skip that process and not let yourself be jailed by paying something that is called by posting bail. Uh, and that, of course, discriminates against people from poorer backgrounds who will just remain or in prison uh, and cannot skip trial only because they do not have the monetary capacity for it. 
So this is why um, thought went uh, behind it and people said, ah, why don't we use algorithm? Uh, I want to say that as required by law, Compass doesn't include race in calculating its risk scores, okay? This is important to know. Um, still, and that's the argument against, even though race cannot be used as a variable, the study by ProPublica argued that the tool was still biased against blacks. Uh, it found that among defendants who were never rearrested, black defendants were twice as likely as white ones to have been labeled high risk, which is a striking result because it shows that even though race was not used as a variable, the results were highly, highly biased and unfair towards a certain population. It still discriminates, and this argument goes against. We're gonna dig into the why of this. So first is to give a little example of how it worked. Uh, you see this compass is giving low risk to Lugo and is giving a medium risk of six uh, to Mallory Williams. Um, Lugo um, crashed his Lincoln Navigator into a Toyota uh, while drunk and uh, he was rated low risk and um, actually was rearrested anyway afterwards. And Mallory was only rated risk of six uh, she never reoffended uh, later on, and she had only cho two small misdemeanors. This was their difference. This was not okay. What about these other guys? And I think here is even more striking. Um, Dylan uh, had one attempted burglary and three drug possessions after being rearrested. So the case of rearrest, which is a variable that should count as a correlation for your risk, still. Dylan got low risk three. Bernard only resisted arrest without violence once, never got rearrested after that, and he got a high risk of 10. There was something not right with the algorithm, right? So that was simply their difference. Okay. Uh, now we try it our, ourselves. We have 30 minutes for that, which is good. Um, so we are deeming Compass not to be fair, right? We are we're saying, you're, you're not okay. Can we make, can we do it better than Compass? Let's try to make it fair, okay? This is what the MIT Technology Review tried to do, and I just broke it into passages for you guys to try and let us try together. So first step, are you all ready? I need your brains. Let's have a click at the chat. Oh, I see there is a discussion. This is great. Thank you guys for that. It's uh, you're engaging, that's great. Um, okay, so we go into our case study. Remember, so you see numbers from one to 10. This is the risk, okay? So the ones on the left have low risk and the ones on the right have, are, high, uh, are high risk and all these dots represent the defendants. Um, so some of those will be jailed pre-trial, so we'll go to jail. Others will be instead released immediately. These are the two outcomes. Some will go on to be rearrested after they are released and others will not. Uh, this is important to know beforehand. Now, we have two potential outcomes for prediction and we want to compare two things. Uh, the predictions, which defendants, which means defendants receiving low risk or high risk, and that's the prediction of the algorithm against the real world outcomes, okay? Uh, which is, does the defendant prediction free or jail? versus your world, does the defendant actually get rearrested or does not get rearrested? Which means were we right in rating him high risk, we were not right in case he does not get rearrested, and we were right in case he does get rearrested. Basically our confirmation happens whether our predictions match the real world. Okay, I'll let a couple of minutes for this to sink in. Of course, the errors we can make is if we deem someone low risk and then in our predictions and then this person goes on to get rearrested, we made an error. There's not a match. So the cross basically between low risk and rearrest. And if we deem someone high risk and then this person does not get rearrested, that's also an error we made. So keeping this in mind, okay, what is Compass trained on? Yeah, it's, it's trained on county data. Uh, I'm gonna talk about it towards the end, 
it was like a funny revelation, but like it's based on data from different counties within the US. Uh, and it's uh, as data, it uses what we saw here. Start, no race, the age, criminal record, and rearrest. I dig more into that, and that's not the only three variables. This was a simplification. Of course, uh, there are different articles that also um, suggest that they might also use like psychological factors. For example, if someone has or has needed psychological help before, uh, some other articles also suggested whether someone was employed or not. So there's a lot going into that. No worries. Uh, feel free to ask questions. So this is our starting point. Real predictions versus real world, okay. Where do we go? Buy a case study. Now I will send this link to you guys because you will have to play with this tool. I will send it in the chat. So try it around. I'll explain better what you're doing when you're moving the tool around, okay? Here for everyone. I hope all of you received it. Try to open it. And you will see that basically what's happening is this, maybe it's better here in the image. So here is where compass puts the threshold, okay? Between seven and eight. The dots you see have changed, right? The filled ones are cases of people who get rearrested in the end. And the ones that are not filled instead are cases of people who did not get, get rearrested in the end. So if what we wanted from the very beginning is our predictions of high, high risk and low risk to match with uh, the real world outcomes of someone getting rearrested or not rearrested, where would you put the threshold? If you want to have like 100% accuracy, basically. I wait for the chat. You still, you need some time. I feel like feel free to play around first with it. The confusion matrix, uh, Madame, is a really good point. It comes soon. Uh, so this is like the most simple version what I'm showing now, but we add complexity. Believe me, the confusion matrix comes up. Uh, somewhere between six and seven. Yeah, but well, that's totally correct. So what happens is when I go here, the accuracy goes to 100. And compass is here. So compass doesn't have 100%. In this case, which is hypothetical, it would have 93. Why would it have 93? Because in this case, this would be an error, what you see here. Uh, these people would actually not be jailed because they are below the risk threshold, but as they're filled dots, they would be rearrested. So our prediction of them being low risk does not match what happens in the real world. So what we aim at is here, 100% accuracy. Now, here, really, um, really easy case. That's not what it usually, what usually happens. Uh, what we end up doing in real life, it's more something like that. And I'm gonna, no, wait, that's the result. I couldn't reveal it. Okay, uh, here, it's totally different. And I'm going to send you the link for this as well. In this case, what happens now is that while before we had a perfect case, because rearrests and arrests were not crossing with each other, as Mamadou suggested, now they're crossing with each other. And now we add this layer of complexity then. What happens here is that cases of rearrest and not are distributed across the board. Try to play around with what you received in the link. And remember, you again want to maximize accuracy, right? You want to get to try to get at that 100% once again. Uh, play around and tell me whether you can reach this level of accuracy. Here, for example, I go up.
seems nowhere. Yeah, Basil is really correct. What happened is that no matter where you place the thresholds, uh, it's never perfect. We will always end up jailing some defendants um, that then, like, wrongly, because they are not filled dots. So, for example, if I put it between six and seven, like before, I will end up jailing all these white ones, which actually do not end up being rearrested. So these are needlessly jailed, and that's already an error. And on the other hand, instead, all these field dots are people whom I missed to classify as high risk and who will, will go on and, and reoffend, right? So what this the lesson to bring home from this first part is that it's always a trade-off. And this trade-off is a trade-off that our legal system, uh, especially in the US in this case specifically, but in general, has had to deal with. Uh, it's not it's nothing new uh, about algorithms. To make these trade-offs more clear, um, now we are going to see something that is a bit more complicated. Uh, we see the percentage of incorrect predictions complex makes on each side of the threshold, instead of just measure, measuring the overall accuracy. So what we do now, you will see here, we're going to break down accuracy. And I'll take some time for this because I think we need that to sink in. Like we will be able to explicitly see whether our threshold, as we said now, needlessly favors, no, favors basically needlessly keeping people in jail, which is what we saw here. So if we put someone above the threshold and they don't end up getting rearrested, we basically put these people wrongly in jail. Or we see if the threshold we chose favors, on the other hand, not incriminating and not putting people in jail that in the end, however, end up being rearrested. Now, something to keep in mind as we reason on this is what should we, like, what mistake should we be more lenient on? Do we prefer, um, let's say, putting people needlessly in jail? Or do we, or is it worse, and that's again an ethical question, to fail to put people in jail that then nevertheless are culprits and go out and do and do bad things. Now, being the cunt of the situation, I will ask you to follow this general rule in the way we will act uh, through this example, which is, it is better than 10 guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer. And this is like a quote, famous quote by William Blackstone, a judge in the US. Um, and his quote is actually really influential in the US. It's what most of the system is based on. From this, you might uh, guess that the error that they're more lenient on is basically they prefer to be, um, to be less strict on, um, on people who actually deserve to be, deserve it's a bad word, the people who uh, ought to be jailed, uh, but they let them out. Uh, then to be too stringent on putting people in jail than shouldn't have been there. So in, in William Blackstone's work, he prefers to put 10 guilty persons unleashed um, and to let them out of prison than by mistake putting one in jail who didn't have to. So now we exemplify that in this case study. Now I'll give you this link as well. For this, I will let you have a little bit more time because this is more complicated. You can play around with this threshold and you will see that the accuracy now is split. Here we go. Try it out, let me know what you think. You will see that, so in order to, to tell you what we would like to do according, if we follow our rule, is to minimize needlessly jailed because you want to be, uh, you want to avoid, you want to be more stringent on, on putting people wrongly in jail. And we want to be a bit more relaxed on, you know, letting people go out, even so they get rearrested. Um, so we want to very much minimize needlessly jail. Still, however, we want to find a balance between the two, because we also do not want anarchy, right? So try to play around with that for a couple of minutes. I'll just let you like just study that a bit and then let me know where 
you would put the threshold. <laughs> Sorry for using anarchy in a negative way. Oh, we have an opinion already. So Irene says we should align, assign low risk to everyone. Uh, Irene, what threshold would you suggest? Between, oh, you, okay, so Batul says between four and five. Amadou, four and five, if it's, if it's right anyway. Yeah, no worries, there's not, in this case, it's really not a right question or a right answer. So completely avoid putting innocent people in jail, I would suggest 10, but it wouldn't be balanced. That's also a, a really fair opinion. Uh, it's like, okay, I would put the, the threshold in 10, because uh, then really just really few people would go to jail, but I, she's still aware that then our criteria, what we chose to abide by, would not be balanced. Uh, Batul and Mamadou proposed between four and five, and that's also an interesting point. The first time I played around with this, I just looked at the accuracy rates, and I also thought, oh, wow, that's, um, that's great. Like, we can just put it between four and five, uh, and and the trick works. But if you really think about what you what we are doing, if we put it between four and five, it means that our um, our condition for someone to go to jail or not is really really stringent. It means that if you are rated anything below four, which is less than half on the, on our scale, you will go to jail. Maybe we will have a really high grade that our our scores will match. But we would put in jail like a lot, a lot of people. I realize when we chose 10, we give second chance to people if I'm right. That's also, that's also nice, but yeah. So you see, it's basically, I mean, at the end of the day, what this boils down to is that um, there are some problems. Like the first is that better predictions, such as like improving accuracy, can always help to reduce error, but we're never gonna minimize or let's say avoid error overall. No matter how much data we collect, uh, two people who took, uh, uh, who look the same to the algorithm might end up having two different fates, whether by choice or not. So we have to take that into account in our calculations. And the second problem is that even if you follow compass recommendations really consistently, Someone, a human, like us, like what we are doing now, has to decide where to put the threshold, right? And that is a decision that, as we saw from Batu uh, considerations, as Irene, um, Irene considerations, it is a, a choice that uh, requires many more considerations, political, economic, and, uh, and all of those. It's not, it's not anymore a choice of accuracy, right? So what do, what, how do we balance uh, our pol political and economic wills with also our need to respect the criteria? That's an open question. Um, that I want to leave you with, but it's not over because I think Phil put in an interesting one. He said, ah, false positive rate versus true negative rate, right? This is what we have dealt with so far. Even though you, you thought that might be complicated, now we go into a level more. What if we check for different populations, okay, within uh, our sample? So uh, let's see what our data looks like when we consider the defendant's race, which was the very problem in Compass, okay? So now I will ask you, I will send you the link, move each threshold to see how it affects black and white defendants in a different way, okay? So basically we do the same exercise of what we have just done, but we have gonna have like a, an eye of care for how it differently affects one population over the other. Here we go. Feel free to play around with that. 
uh, I will put this, I think, one second big screen again, because I saw that sadly in the HTML, you can't see the last part of accuracy so well. So hopefully having this open will help. So I give you a little bit of time to play around with that. And remember that you would like, once again, according to our criteria, to minimize the needless new jail without giving up anyway the relieved but rearrested, which is again also false positive rate versus true negative rate. Give you a bit of time, play around with it, and tell me if you have what threshold would would actually be fair in the same way to both groups. Looking at the chat, still giving you the first time. Does anyone have a suggested threshold this time? It's, it gets tougher. You want to be as fair to one group as to the other, or at least approach fairness. I see the chat is being silent. Tough questions on the plate today. Oh, here we go back. So Brigitte says four, between three and four as well, uh, by Batul, and Mamadou says five and six for white, and seven and eight for black. Oh, this, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mean. I mean, not mean, really nice. Uh, Actually, a really interesting point by Mamadou, which basically uh, goes into and ties really well into our next point. So let's see what's happening here. If we move around the arrow, what we end up seeing is that generally, um, let's see what Compass is doing here, right? Um, this needlessly jail is what we wanted to minimize. When we use the threshold between seven and eight, we have like, uh, basically we are, treating whites uh, doubly in a double better than than blacks in that way we are much we're double more likely to needlessly jail a person of color with this threshold which is wanted instead what you, what instead we wanted to minimize um, now we are basically double more likely to put a person of color in jail than a white person within this threshold and instead when we go into the other criteria, released but rearrested, what we wanted to be lenient with, we're so much more likely, 81%, to be lenient with people that are uh, white than with people of color. So we're much more likely to say, when we put our threshold here, hey, if it's between seven and eight, we are gonna let so many filled dots um, go that instead will be rearrested. And actually, there's one case I think that was even more interesting. I tried it yesterday, and that was really like sometimes bias gets really stark. Maybe it was between six and seven. Now it's not showing so well. But I think you have like here, you're almost double or what two thirds more lenient, no, one third more lenient with whites than blacks, and between six and seven, which is something that we proposed before, right? Uh, you are three times more likely to needlessly jail a person of color than a, than a white person. But then we had a good suggestion in the chat, uh, <laughs> so bad, um, which is five and six for white. So I'm just gonna try that. Between five and six for white and um, seven and eight for blacks. 
Now the rates look much more similar, okay? So five and six, right? Yes. Let's say if we put this, no, I think, like basically if we go and play around with it, we see that if we use different risk scores overall, so different standards for people of color and for white people, we would actually achieve much better rates, uh, much fairer rates also between the two groups. It means that by using different standards overall in terms of thresholds, we would actually be treating white people as well or as badly as people of color. Um, did we solve the problem? That is now the bigger question. And now we're gonna see, one second, let's get back to the presentation. So what we did in the end is here, when we use the same threshold for both, we couldn't settle. Uh, we had a really good, uh, a really good uh, suggestion by Gamadou, who said, let's try to use two different thresholds and look what happens. We basically have the same uh, rates. Uh, should we do that? I mean, you know what that would entail, right? It would entail to basically, if you're a, a white person and you might potentially be arrested, uh, if you're deemed um, just risk seven, you will be arrested. And if you're a person of color and you're deemed risk uh, seven as well, in the same case, you will not be uh, arrested. Uh, is that fair? That, like, that, play, that is playing with two different conceptions of fairness. One says, okay, treat in the first example, when we have the same threshold for everyone, we treat people with the same risk scores in the same way. And in the second one, we want instead to keep, uh, to keep error rates comparable between our groups. Um, is there a solution? Which one will we use? I mean, I would love the chat to discuss about this um, because there's not really a solution and some considerations that I find in the chat uh, yeah, ha have a point. Uh, as we said, we gave two definitions of fairness and why are we still not settling? Because black and white defendants are basically arrested at different rates to begin with, even before an algorithm is built. Whereas 52%, and that's in the county of Compass, okay, in the US, 52% 52, 52 of black defendants over there were rearrested in what is called Broward County, where it was used. And only 39% of white defendants instead were uh, rearrested. Uh, this difference is also found across many other jurisdictions in the US, uh, in part also because of the country's history of police, which disproportionately targets minorities. Um, predictions reflect the data used to make them, whether by an algorithm or whether uh, by, by a human. Uh, if black defendants are arrested at a higher rate uh, than white defendants in the real world, they will have a higher rate of predicted arrest as well. This means they will also have a higher risk score on average. And this is what skews all of our results and what doesn't allow us to reach the perfect conclusion. So it's true, and um, this is a fact, no matter what algorithm we use, okay? It's, it's a dilemma. So, this is the exercise. Keep on use, using it, keep on playing around with it and see what happens. Um, of course, this case of bias is not just limited to the judiciary. It goes into all of the cases of AI applications, which um, we saw before. Um, so what has changed, however, with algorithms? What is different between just not using them? Um, so even though we said that one argument for it was to avoid the bias in judges, okay? So though judges may not always be transparent about how they choose between different notions of fairness, people can contest their decisions. You can appeal. Uh, in contrast, Compass, which is made by the private company North Point, is a trade secret that cannot be publicly reviewed or interrogated. That is what has changed. We are incurring in the same problems, but we were not giving people is a chance for accountability, or even just access, which are values, virtue ethics values, which have come up several times uh, in the talk. 
Ooh, just three minutes before the end. This is the end. Uh, we might have time for a couple of questions. Before that, and before you all go away, what I would like to do is do a little bit of shameless requests. Uh, I'm sorry about them, but I hope it's okay. Um, so we have worked really hard for this workshop. A lot of time and hard work, blood and sweat went into it. Um, and if you can, we would like to ask you to support us uh, in many ways. It doesn't matter what you can do. There's always something that is possible. So ways to help us. You can also just like, share, or follow us. That's like the basic package. <laughs> and uh, level two, you can talk about us. At the end, uh, we will give you an attendance confirmation with a certificate that is being prepared right now. So you will have a certified AI for People course. Uh, of course, it's not that it can be recognized in terms of ECTS. Uh, it's internal validation, uh, but you will remember us. So you can share it on LinkedIn. You can, um, you can put it on, on your wall as you please. Or there's always the possibility of supporting us uh, with some small donations. We are a no-profit. Uh, we have only, we completely run on donations of people. We have not received donations from um, any peculiar corporation or uh, anything like that, neither governments. So we are fueled by you. Um, as you see, you can also just donate five euros. Um, this is what my sister did. So <laughs> no worries. And you can also just like us. So that's, that's not a problem. Um, questions and answers now. We are almost out of time, but I would still ask, or I would still take, I think, one or two questions. And I saw that many of you are engaged in discussions, so I welcome you or I encourage you to share maybe contacts also with each other. Of course, it's something that you have to do. We can't deal with that for matters of privacy, uh, but if you want to share contacts with someone that you met in this chat, please do so. Uh, or ask each other's LinkedIn, uh, please do so. Uh, I'm happy if this generates conversations. Oh, thank you. That's nice. I read the chat now. Uh, and after this, there is actually, because this came up in the presentation, there is cultural AI, another uh, workshop. Is it straight after this, Phil? Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, for sure there's a break at 14. Yes. With Maurice, so at two, we have the speaker in the room. Uh, is going to talk about cultural AI. Um, so for those who are interested in a non-Western perspective on the matter, please go there. Uh, I will be there as well, uh, active in the chat. Uh, I will play the fill of the situation over there. So please come along. Yes, is the next one. There's the link in the chat. Okay, perfect. Guys, then I think, yes, I see the chat is talking and slowly fading. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I really liked your energy and uh, your, your engagement. Um, I will leave my contacts here as you're all leaving. So you can feel free to message me or reach us on the socials at any point. Thank you so much. And maybe I should stop the recording.